Hi, I'm Frida Brook. I'm the Acquisitions and Resource Management Librarian here at Luther. And I'm going to be talking to you today a little bit about how news is produced and consumed during um, this time of pandemic and how we can cultivate um, a trustworthy coterie of news sources um, to help keep us informed. I want to start by thinking about how news and information um, are produced around a public health event like this pandemic and why it is that we're seeing concerns right now about um, misinformation and fake news sort of heightened concerns. Traditionally, um, different kinds of information are produced through different channels with different purposes, different audiences, different standards of research and editorial and fact-checking norms. In the pandemic, the demand and desire for information is quite high and a lot of information is being produced and consumed. Um, but this also means that we need to approach that information with more of a critical lens. We need to evaluate the sources and purposes of the information to understand its context and really how trustworthy it is. The information cycle framework um, helps us understand how, when, and why different kinds of information are produced about this current health crisis. So we're going to dive into this a little bit. So we can think about day one of the information cycle as either being the first day that we learned about um, the COVID-19 uh, flu virus, um, or we could think about it as um, the first day that there were infections in the United States or infections in the state that we live in, or it could be sort of the first day of any sort of major development as we're moving through this fast paced news environment. Um, one of the earliest sources of information on that first day is going to come from public health officials. Um, we're seeing daily press conferences from the White House and from some state governors. Um, and often what they're saying is, you know, the latest infection numbers, they're telling you about policy changes that are being announced. Um, you know, and then likewise, news outlets um, also produce information on a daily basis, on an ongoing basis. And so initial news articles um, as, you know, as information develops, as, as topics develop, um, are usually fairly short and the journalist um, tends to talk to experts and people familiar with the events. Um, journalists may also do some background research to help contextualize that information for their readers or viewers. Um, so while both um, public officials and journalists have this uh, a similar goal in mind of informing the public, it isn't uncommon for news articles to prevent additional information, ad additional perspectives. Um, some of them might even be critical perspectives whereas the official information um, is more likely to stick very closely to the facts at hand and any information that supports the policies that they are enacting. Um, so it's important when we interpret public statements to know um, who's making that statement and to distinguish among people like public health officials who tend to have expertise in that area and politicians who don't typically have medical expertise. As we move forward in time, we continue to see news articles and official information released, especially as the situation develops. We also start to see some more analytical and opinion-based information resources because people have had time to look at the facts and the information reported by the officials and by news outlets and respond to it. Um, so it's the difference between a news report saying 100 people have tested positive in this meatpacking plant and um, an agricultural economist saying, because meatpacking plants have been operating at a reduced capacity, we're seeing an increase in the price of beef and pork at the grocery stores. The second statement requires more analysis, more data and contextual information, and thus it isn't produced as quickly. We expect to see that later in the information cycle. And then as we continue to move out away from the initial event, 
um, initial infections, whatever it is we're calling day one. This is when we'll start seeing more um, regular local and regional information, right? So public officials had fewer resources. Um, local public officials had fewer resources than the federal government. So we don't necessarily expect to see them producing information um, as quickly um, or that information being as widely reported in local news sources. We continue to see news and analysis over this period of time. Um, and in some respects, we might expect it to be more reliable and better analyzed as the people making that information has ha have had more time to do that analysis. Um, but we still need to be cautious. Um, so one thing we're seeing in this crisis is that every state has its own process and timeline for collecting and reporting data about testing, infections, deaths, etc. Um, there isn't a national standard for what data to collect or how to report it. So we need to be careful with any analysis that does heavy direct comparisons among states because that is a little bit like comparing apples to oranges, right? They're not necessarily, the states are not necessarily reporting the same kind of data that makes it hard to do those direct comparisons. We might also expect to see some scientific research specific to COVID-19 start to emerge as we have. Um, it takes time for researchers to collect samples, to implement protocols, to run experiments, collect results. So here's the important thing to remember. Any scientific research we're seeing in these early stages, which we're still in, have not been through the full usual scientific vetting process, which we call peer review. Typically, scientific research takes a long, um, a long time to produce because it goes through this thorough review by multiple experts before it's published. Um, the whole process can take six months or more. Currently, there just hasn't been time for this level of, um, of peer review on scientific research in COVID-19, which means that we're still seeing scientific research that hasn't been as thoroughly vetted and evaluated. It's a lot of its preliminary research. You know, one of the touchstones of um, scientific research is the idea of reproducible results. We want to make sure that if one group of scientists in a lab are getting one set of results, that the same experiment can be done by a different group of scientists under the same conditions and they will get the same results. This is a high standard to meet, especially when it comes to medical research um, and human subjects. But because it is high, because it's a high standard, that's why we place so much trust in it. Um, and we've seen this play out with some of the early reports about treatment protocols where one hospital sees some promising results, but then when other hospitals try the same treatment, it isn't as effective. So we need to be really cautious with how much trust we place in early scientific research reports, not because the scientists are not credible, but because there hasn't been enough time for the full scientific vetting process to take place. As we move further out in the um, information cycle, this will give more time for scientific research and the publication process to proceed. We'll start to see duplicate studies of patient treatments and a developing understanding of how the virus survives and spreads. And eventually we'll see more traditional peer reviewed research and a higher degree of scientific consensus around these issues. We can also start to see more comprehensive assessment and analysis of things like effectiveness of different policies in responding to the virus, um, comparing between countries or between states in the United States. These types of scholarly analyses won't be possible until much later after the crisis has played out more fully and more consistent data is available. However, it's still important that scholars do them, even if they are um, sort of after the fact, so to speak, because that contributes to our collective body of knowledge around viral outbreaks generally and how best to contain them. And a lot of the research that was done on prior viral outbreaks is informing how we are responding to this outbreak. Of course, what I've been describing here is really a simplified and idealized form of information dissemination. 
there are several other factors in play that shape how we as individuals find information and the quality of that information. Everyone has sort of a personal information landscape, news sources that we regularly read, watch, or seek out, and our own sense of which sources are trustworthy or not. Studies from the Pew Research Center show that media consumption habits are generational. So older Americans prefer traditional print um, and television formats, while younger folks have a stronger preference for online formats. Our media landscape is also politically polarized. Um, Republicans and Democrats get their news from different sources, and Republicans actually have fewer trusted sources, news sources, than Democrats do. These different preferences create divisions in how we collectively understand this current situation. We're seeing different stories, different perspectives are being emphasized differently in various news outlets. But let's talk about how social media platforms specifically can further exacerbate those divisions. So if I go to CNN.com or if you go to CNN.com, we're going to see the same stories. So if we have similar trusted sources and we seek them out, we're going to see the same thing. But if I go to Facebook or Twitter, I'm going to see an entirely different set of links and stories than if you go to the same platform. What we're seeing is um, based on who we're friends with, which accounts we follow. Um, and within that, it's also based on the algorithms of those platforms they determine which stories they show us and which links and sources sort of rise to the top of our news feeds. There are a lot of different ways that they do this, um, but they tend to favor links or posts that have created more response from other users. So we're more likely to see this kind of viral content, content that causes strong emotional response, be that positive emotion or negative emotion. In the context of the COVID-19 outbreak, the stories that are going viral, getting more reaction on social media sites, are the stories that cause outrage or shock or delight and distraction. Here are some examples. When we see the stories, they're coming from outlets that we're not familiar with. Um, so we see the news articles shared through social media or linked from another website, or people just repeat information without including a source. A lot of us like to think that we're good at spotting fake news, and it's easy to think that the problem is always my grandma or my uncle who just isn't as tech savvy. but you know, but thinking that I can tell the difference. And the thing is that it's just not true. We're bad at spotting fake news. Studies have shown that people of all ages are bad at identifying fake news stories. And there are a number of reasons for this. For one thing, um, we're psychologically disposed to believe things that confirm our pre-existing worldview. So if you see a negative story about President Trump, you're more likely to believe it if you're liberal than if you're conservative. And we're also more likely to share those stories that evoke strong emotions, which can really be compounded by these kinds of um, partisan dispositions. Another challenge is that fake news stories are often a mix of true and false information, which make them seem more credible. 
yet another challenge is that it's hard for us to instinctively vet scientific information because many of us simply do not have the expertise to assess a scientific claim on its face value. I am an information scientist, but that doesn't actually help me to on its face assess a claim about the coronavirus and whether or not a treatment is effective. I simply don't have the background area to, to do that. And finally, um, the sheer quantity of information that we encounter every day makes it hard to spot fake news. And this is true during times of pandemic and during regular times. Most of the information that we encounter is not fake news. But because of the volume of information that we have to sift through, we don't have the time or the mental capacity to individually evaluate every claim or story that we see in our news feeds. Um, and this, this kind of dampening of our um, ability to do this kind of assessment is called information overload. So what can we do? <laughs> So first of all, I want to acknowledge that a lot of the problem of fake news is structural. It's not individual. It's based on how social media companies organize content, how they make money, what kinds of incentives people have to make clickbait and fake news kinds of content. And I've already said that we as individuals are bad at identifying fake news. Um, but I also think there are some dispositions that we can cultivate as news consumers um, to help us become better at it. So I'm gonna briefly talk about a few things that, that we can do. And I wanna give credit to Mike Caulfield, um, whose framing of fact-checking I'm gonna borrow for some of this. Um, it's from his book that's called Web Literacy for Student Fact-Checkers and Other People Who Care About Facts. So the first thing that we need to do um, is check our emotions. Specifically, we need to be more skeptical of content that is emotionally charged or seems designed to elicit strong emotions. Often that content is written in order to get shared on social media. Even um, if it's not explicitly false, emotional language and rhetoric can distort our understanding of the facts and it dampens our critical thinking skills. Second, we, um, you know, if you come across a story that you think might be fake, something that seems, like I said, designed to trigger our emotions or doesn't um, on its face seem credible, you can actually look to see if that story has already been evaluated um, by an established fact checking site like Snopes. Here are some other, um, some other fact checking websites that don't have strong partisan leanings and um, do this kind of work regularly. You can literally just Google like, you know, can I drink Clorox bleach to, um, you know, to, <laughs> to prevent myself from, from getting the coronavirus. And these websites, these are the kinds of websites that will have evaluated that claim already and will tell you whether or not um, it checks out. That one doesn't. And then finally, even when a claim hasn't already been evaluated um, or it's not necessarily the kind of thing that's like really clearly true or false, um, you can do your own evaluation of the source. Um, and the, a good way to do this is called um, lateral reading. So what this means is looking across several outside sources instead of diving deeper into the source at hand. So if you're on a site that you're not familiar with, you don't want to go to the about page to read what they have to say about themselves, because if you don't know if a site is credible, why would you trust what they have to say about themselves? Instead, what you can do is um, you can perform a search, like a Google search, for that site or organization and look for what other trusted sources have to say about it. This is an example of how you could, could construct a search like that. I'm searching for the Center for Immigration Studies, and then I say minus site 
colon, and then I put the URL for that site. Because if I just search for the Center for Immigration Studies, what I'm going to find is that website. This construction, which also works on um, some other um, uh, web search engines, the say minus site colon, um, tells it to look for that phrase Center for Immigration Studies on sites other than CIS.org, which is the um, URL of that site. And then these are some of the sources that I came across when I did this search. So I'm seeing that the Southern Poverty Law Center has, um, has some information on them. I'm seeing Wikipedia has information, PolitiFact, Washington Post. So these are all sites that are already are in my um, sort of list of sources that I'm familiar with that I know are more credible um, and are more trustworthy. And so reading what they have to say about this organization will help me do my own contextual assessment of information that I'm receiving from this organization. So some of the things um, that I'm looking for when I evaluate a source like this um, is thinking about process, expertise, and aim. And I, I acknowledge that this can be a little bit tricky, right? It's not always easy to assess, um, to assess a site that you're not familiar with. Um, but when you're looking at sites that produce information, produce news, um, these are good things to think about. So process, asking questions like, does this publication have a process in place for encouraging accuracy, verifying facts, and correcting mistakes. Credible mainstream news outlets all have this. They all have some sort of process in place um, for doing fact checking and for issuing um, corrections when they have made a mistake. So do scholarly publications. Blogs, on the other hand, often do not. The next thing I'm looking for is expertise. So does the source or the author have a developed field of expertise in this area? And we see this in scholarly writing for sure. Um, it isn't you know, just that someone has um, a, a degree, is educated, but it's that they have years of expertise developed in a specific area, and that's the area that they are writing about. Um, Journalists reporting on a pandemic mostly don't have that level of expertise on virology or public health, but you would expect them, you would want to see them talking to and quoting people who do have that expertise. Additionally, um, there is there is some level of professional expertise that gets developed among journalists who work certain beats, right? So a science reporter, someone who often writes about science and health stories, um, might have sort of a better contextual understanding and be able to provide more of that understanding to their readers than someone who doesn't generally cover those kinds of um, those kinds of topics. And then finally. Um, What's the aim of this publication, this author, or this media source? Um, what are they trying to accomplish? And this can be complex. Um, so we talked earlier about how um, there are some overlapping aims between public health officials and newspapers, right? That they are trying to inform the public, but also how those things can diverge a little bit. Um, news outlets often have multiple aims. So, you know, a, news, a newspaper wants to inform the public, but they also need to make money to stay in business. Um, a scholar wants to create new knowledge that contributes to our understanding of how this virus spreads, but she also benefits by, um, by publishing on this topic in that it furthers her career and her reputation, right? So it can be a complicated thing. So there, oftentimes, um, outlets, people, they have they have multiple aims. But in general, what I think you want to place, where I think you want to place the most trust, is in publications that have a strong incentive to be factual and credible, as shown by the their authorial intent, their business model, and their um, 
reputational incentives and their history, right? You want to see that those aims are generally pointing them in the direction of being factual and credible, and that there aren't other aims that might be taking them too far away from those purposes. And you know, these are news gathering habits that will serve you well in any situation. Um, I think they're especially valuable right now when the stakes are very high for um, for good information um, because, because we're talking about the health of, of our families and our communities, we're talking about our, our economy and our financial stability, and we're talking you know, about sort of the political future of our, of our country. Um, so I hope that you'll kind of take these things into account as you continue to engage with, um, with the topics at hand and in the future. So thanks for listening and stay safe.